All right, welcome listeners. This is the Koo Cattlemen. We're your hosts, Seth and Kimber King. We're really excited and honored to be sitting down today with Tom McConnell of Pell Creek Cattle Company. Um, Tom, how you doing today? Everything going well? Doing really good, surviving the heat wave. Good, yeah, it's hot. It's hot here too. Um, Tom, you have been uh, an American Highland Cattle Association member for almost 25 years. Like I said, you uh, own Pell Creek Cattle Company. Uh, you're really involved in the association, which is part of the reason why we have you here today. Uh, we're going to get into a lot of uh, U.S. history with um, the association with Highlands here in the U.S., uh, but you're also the ACA secretary. You're the ACA historian. Um, you are chair of the education committee, uh, which is um, a, 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 a big uh, support for the podcast is the podcast basically wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the education committee and Tom, um, as well as the social media subcommittee chair, uh, the gathering planning committee chair. Um, and you also, we, Kimber and I had the honor of, of seeing you receive two awards, um, one in South Dakota at the 75th gathering, uh, where you were um, given the Tom Berry Award, which I, I'd like to talk you to talk a little bit about that. And then also uh, you received the the Member of the Year Award for 2023. So the list is long when it comes to Tom. You've got a lot of involvement and obviously you're doing a lot of big things with the association. So well, like I said, we're just honored to sit down with you today and just let the listeners you know, in on who you are and also kind of um, gain some in, some information, some knowledge from you as far as uh, the history of Highland cattle here in the U.S. So, Tom, I'm going to stop talking so much. If you could just kind of just uh, give us a little bit of information about yourself and about your, um, your farm, your cattle, and then we'll kind of go into uh, the history of Highland cattle in the U.S., Okay. Well, I kind of fell into the breed by accident. Uh, moved back to Minnesota out of Colorado, bought a bought the family farm site and kind of needed cows. So I uh, had a relative that had a couple unregistered highlands and I just wanted freezer beef. So we brought them here, uh, raised them for about 10 years. And then as the girls got bigger, they wanted to show cattle and that's something I had no idea how to do. So we kind of made the transition over to registered, uh, got involved with 4-H, learned to show, got involved with ACA shows, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're small scale. Uh, we strictly do this just to breed better cattle and compete and show. Uh, so that's kind of my involvement with the breed. And then, uh, oh, shoot, what else did you ask then about? Uh, tell us a little bit about, um, tell us a little bit about the awards that you received, specifically the Tom Barry. Okay. <clears throat> Well, all this kind of stems from being bored one winter. I think it was like the winter of 2019. I just wanted to find out why in the heck the Highlands were in this country. And there was a little bit of information on the website, the ACA website. Uh, they had the name SF Biddle. So I kind of went on a search on that. And it was tough because it wasn't the correct name. But uh, I ended up finding out about the Biddle guy. So I, it just interests me, the, the Western and the ranch history. And then uh, I think I was talking to Jean about it. She's like, Tom, you got to write a story, write, write an article about this guy. So I did more research. I actually went out to his ranch, uh, got some old photographs from his ranch. Sadly, none of them have highlands in it. Did a lot of research on them, uh, some on the internet, some through books, uh, some in person out there talking to people. Uh, so that kind of got the ball rolling for the his history part, getting my involvement. Uh, and that just kind of snowballed into the Barry family and the association. I, I had no intention of going there. Uh, it was merely an accident. This was during COVID. You weren't going anywhere. You were staying at home a lot. So I was on the computer a lot. Uh, just started researching the Berries. came up with some photographs from them. I found out they were in the Hall of Fame, made that trip, uh, put some photos online on a, in a Facebook group for uh, South Dakota history, and people came out of the woodwork. And it just snowballed from there. Uh, got to meet the family. 
a lot of relatives. Uh, I've been to the ranch multiple times. I've been out there for brandings, been out there for tours. Uh, it all just kind of snowballed. And then the whole, uh, uh, the 75th was coming up. I just pitched that idea to the association. They loved it. And we formed a committee and we got the ball rolling on that. And that's how the gathering ended up in South Dakota, going back to our birthplace. Wow. Um, now, Tom Barry is one of the original uh, individuals who brought Highland cattle to the U.S. Is that correct? Is that what the award is for? Not, not entirely correct. The award was basically for pooling all this history together and getting us out to South Dakota. It was, it was a, it was a very nice recognition for mm -hmm. what I was doing. But uh, Tom Barry, he was, he was the elder of the Barry family. He was Baxter and Paul, who are also founding members. He was their father. He was the governor of South Dakota back during the depression. Uh, I got to talk to a cowboy named Lyle O'Brien. I think Lyle's close to 90 now, 89 or 90. Talked to him probably two, three years ago. And he told me that the association was Tom Barry's idea. So he he's kind of, you know, a lot of people think Baxter is Tom's son. Baxter did the legwork. He did all the hard work getting it going. But Tom was the one that put the idea into Baxter's head to, to have an association to start recording the pedigrees on these cattle. Okay. So he's basically the father of Aka. I would say, yeah, that would be a good good name for him. And now you're also the Aka historian. Were you, were you the Aka historian prior to 2020, or how long have you been doing that? I can't I can't remember when this started. It's only been about a year, year and a half. Okay. Uh, this was one of those things I was unaware of. Uh, if there was a motion made in a board meeting to have an official historian. We've never had one before. And uh, so I'm pretty sure this was 20, it would have been probably fall of 2023 that this idea came up and the board voted on the idea. So I was nominated and that passed and here I sit. Mm -hmm. And now is that something that you're, I mean, are you currently working on a project as, as, as the historian or what, what are you doing right now as, you know, in that role? It's a little slow right now just because, well, we got the gathering out of the way and everything, and then I had to kind of get into my other, back into my other committee assignments. Uh, gets a little overwhelming. There's a lot of work to do. We are all volunteers, so you got to kind of divvy up your time. The one project I'm working on right now is we're putting a brochure together. Uh, you've seen all the other ACA brochures. We're going to have one basically for ACA's history. Uh, our history, the association's history, is our our strong point that and the fact that we're a full blood registry those are the two things that separate us and make us the premier registry in this country is we we have the history we were founded by cattlemen for the breed and we have a full blood registry which can date back can be you know dated back to the original herd book in scotland most of our animals can get traced back to that gotcha okay well tom kind of walk us into then um the uh, how Highlands first arrived here in, in the U.S. Can you kind of tell us about that a little bit? That is, I've I've looked on the internet a lot, and actually Wally Condon probably can do more on this subject. Uh, there is no definitive printed information. We really don't know. We don't have the evidence. Uh, I can't remember the dates. You know, you heard Wally talk about the Highlands in Alaska. I'm guessing they were there before Alaska was a state. So technically they probably wouldn't be the first ones in the country because we weren't a country. Alaska wasn't part of the country. Uh, here in the in the continental US, uh, that claim kind of goes to Spencer Fullerton Baird Biddle. Uh, he was the rancher in Southeast Montana. Uh, a town called Biddle, Montana is named after him. His ranch sits right there at the town. But uh, he, as far as we know, documented wise, he brought the first Highlands to this country, and that was in 1896. Now, he had them already before he imported them. This is where it gets tricky. He had a cowboy called, uh, I believe his name was Frank Ward, 
was one of his cowboys on the ranch and they were sitting around the campfire one night and Frank made the comment that his dad down in Kansas had a herd of highlands. So uh, Spencer Biddle, he went down there and bought the herd lock, stock, and barrel. I think there was 20, 25 something head. And they trailed those all the way back up to Biddle, Montana. So those, that was in 18, I want to say 94 off the top of my head. So two years before he actually imported them. So there were highlands here. We don't know how they got here. Mm -hmm. One theory was they came to New York State from Canada for a uh, livestock exposition or a World's Fair or something. And from there, they're, they couldn't go back to Canada because of all the import-export rules and, and livestock and stuff, even back in those days. So they had to remain in the United States. Those may be the animals that ended up in Kansas, but we don't definitively know. Tom, I'm going to ask you a really... But either way, Biddle... Do you have that? any idea when they came to Canada? Ooh, no, I do not. Okay. I was just curious if we had any dates to compare between the two. I don't. Okay. I was wondering the same. If I even read it, I probably don't remember it. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering the same thing, but uh, to Tom's credit, he is the ACA uh, historian. Sure, not, not Canadian. Not the Canadian historian. <laughs> American. Amer yes, American. Yes. <laughs> So um, you you were talking a little bit earlier than how the association got started. Was it getting started around the same time? Or I, I'm assuming it took a little while for, for there to be an association formed? Yeah, there was a big gap from the time Biddle. Biddle closed his ranch out early 1900s, so I think 1910, 1912. And those cattle were dispersed. Uh, his His foreman, I think, got the bulk of his herd i think he had like 200 highlands at the time and where they ended up we don't know uh wally go always go back to wally he's uh he was talking about this he said a lot of those animals ended up i believe with like uh, walter hill and the shoot brothers whose their names will come up later but uh but there was a big gap there then for highland activity in the united states uh you know probably a 10 15 year gap it wasn't until the 1920s where things started picking up again. And still, this is still 20 something years before ACA was even thought of. So, uh, but there was more activity, more animals were being imported, uh, mostly into the East Coast states, uh, Massachusetts, New York, uh, New Hampshire, I believe, were kind of bringing them in. Uh, they hadn't found their way out West. Uh, the interesting thing to know, and here's why I started my little history hunt to begin with, uh, when I first got my Highlands, you know, you look at these shaggy beasts, long hair, hair over their eyes, you you know they can withstand winter. And I mean a harsh winter. And I always got to think of one of my favorite topics in Western history was the big die up, uh, the winter of 80, 1886-87. Uh, millions of cattle died up in the northern high plains all the way down to the southern plains. Uh, from basically the Texas panhandle to the Canadian border, the entire herds were wiped out. Uh, they said the stink was so bad in the spring thaw that you couldn't even be out there. The flies were terrible. It was just, it was devastating to the cattle industry. That's when a lot of these ranchers started, and these were all Texas cattle, by the way, all Texas longhorns, crossbreds, corrientes type of cattle. Well, then these ranchers started looking for something that was a little bit hardier. So they started looking at your English breeds, your shorthorns, your Dexters, things like that, uh, Angus. It always shocked me that nobody looked at the Highland. And I always thought that's that's had to be the reason the Highlands ended up here. And my research on Biddle proved that. And I actually found that in a book, in writing, Biddle brought the Highlands here because of the winter of 86, 87, that the, what was called the big die up. So that's always an interesting point to know when you're talking about these cattle uh, and why they're here. Can't really say they saved the, the beef industry back then, but they had a big impact on it. That's they were here, and even Biddle brought them for strictly crossbreeding. Okay. And then when you get back to ACA, that's how ACA started. It was for the crossbreeding, not necessarily ACA, but the berries. Okay, that's what I was going to ask: is if they started crossbreeding at that point to you know make yeah. make that's your, your American breeds hardier. Yep. 
Uh, Baxter Berry, when he took over, uh, Tom Berry became governor in the early in the 1930s. Well, he left the ranch. He he handed it over to Baxter and Baxter's wife Lyndall. So they had the ranch, and Baxter started experimenting with cattle. He wanted to find the best breed that can handle the heat, the high heat out on the Dakota Badlands, and the harsh winters. And he had quite a few breeds at his place, Brahmas, Herefords. Well, they actually started with Herefords. Uh, the Brahmas, he had uh, a breed called Africaner. Uh, just a lot of different cattle there, and he was crossbreeding them. Then he brought in the Highlands. He strictly wanted Highland bulls just for crossbreeding. He had no intention originally to start uh, a registry or start pedigreed full blood cattle. He wanted the crossbreeding. And then after a while, they started after breeding and everything, he realized that this breed was it. The Highland as a breed itself didn't even need to be crossbred. He wanted them on his ranch as, as a breed. And that's how we ended up, or as far as he ended up putting everything together and then becoming, uh, starting the association. Okay, great. So then at that point, he realizes the, the, the breed itself is, is the breed, no need to, to cross. And so the association kind of played that role of keeping the, the breed pure at that point, bringing in, in, importing other animals, I'm assuming. Right. Keeping the breed pure. Back, back in those days when they were importing, these were full blood cattle coming out of Scotland. They were registered in Scotland, but there was no need to bring those papers with them here. There was no registry. Well, then, so basically, you know, like I said before, Tom kind of put the bug into Baxter's ear, start a registry. And then Baxter got with uh, some other cattlemen he knew and who I, I assume they were all raising Highlands at that time. And they formed our first association, or that they were the board on our first association for the association when we first started. And those would be our founders, what we call our founders. Okay. And that was at that point a US association. I'm assuming it wasn't regional at all. Or was it? No, we didn't. They, they were very small. They didn't have the, the regionals like we do now. And the regionals, they're not registries to begin with. They're they support ACA, we ACA sports, them type of thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, they started putting these uh, pedigrees together. Uh, the first ones, they kind of looked around in the U.S. I don't know how many had in the herd book that they started with didn't necessarily have pedigrees, but they were very meticulous of what they did. Uh, I found another thing written, I think it was written by Lindell, where she was talking about how they uh, they just went through these cattle with a fine tooth comb to see which ones could start the breed registry in the U S uh, they had to go through farm records, uh, any kind of breeding records that these guys had importation records. If they didn't have any of those, those cattle never made it into our herd book. Uh, I think there's maybe the first hundred or 200 or something like that in the herd book. You don't see much on their pedigrees uh, just because those are the cattle that were the foundation. Then these founding members, they started going over to Scotland and quite on a frequent basis and in mass started bringing a lot of cattle over here. Uh, most of them, I think, probably came through Canada, the, the, the early ones. I don't know if that was easier for importing or what, but uh, I highly doubt any of them came into the east coast of the U.S. Possible, but I'm, I'm going to guess most came down through Canada as far okay. as the importation process. Gotcha, okay. Um, so it was just easier for, for whatever reason to bring them down through Canada instead of, I guess, ship shipping them or I guess they would have shipped them at that point? I don't know if they shipped on rail. I know like when we were talking about Biddle, he shipped them in on rail, but I never did find out their original, their uh, starting point, but his came out on rail. I'm guessing, you know, I'm sure some of them did in the U.S. We, I just don't have those records, those receipts or anything, shipping bills to tell me where they came from. Sure. So then at I'm that sure point, some came from the East Coast. 
Gotcha. And then once they're starting to import, you were saying they have that pedigree, they have the paperwork, the registration, and then that's kind yep. of where the American yep. associations start building on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Most if you if you've ever done it, and I know a couple people have. I tried it a couple on a couple of mine, and it worked. If you go through the herd book and just pick one bloodline and keep going back on it through the herd book, you end up with Scottish cattle. Mm -hmm. That's the nice thing about our full blood herd book. Right. Yeah. Because I was actually trying to get my cattle to go back to Blue Hill registration, the registration, the bull with registration number one. I think I only had one or two that I found did that. Most of them jump back to Scotland pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Now, is that something anybody can do? Is that something on Akka's website or, or how are you finding that information? Oh, yeah. No, if you could, you get on the website, go to the herd book and just take any one of your animals and just start going back on the bloodlines and keep going back on the pedigree and you'll see where you're at. And, and if you know some of the the historical bulls, like, you know, uh, David of 40 comes to mind or Blue Hill number one comes to mind, uh, you'll be able to trace your, your, your cattle back to where they originated at. Okay. Yeah, I think that it's was a chore, though, because you, you're going through a lot of pages. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be helpful probably for some listeners that are in, interested in that. I know Kimber does a lot of, of that type of pedigree work. Um, and so I know a lot, a lot of people out there are interested in it. Um, anything else you'd like to add at this point, as far as the history goes, Tom? Well, there's a lot to add. Um, <laughs> you know, the association was started in August 30th of 1948, that meeting was held at the Double X Ranch in Belvedere, South Dakota. Uh, it's kind of funny because at that time, and I had to do some research on that one, trying to figure out how it happened because there was no house on the ranch at that time because it had burned down the year before. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I got to talking to a, a lady named Nancy Phipps. She is Tom Berry's oldest granddaughter. Uh, she's a retired doctor living in uh, Rapid City now. So I got to see, I talked with her a couple of times and, but she told me that, uh, and I asked her where the meeting was held at. And she said across the draw from where the original house stood that burned down, they had another house that's not there anymore. And that's where the meetings took place. So it always kind of confused me to how the meeting could have been there if there was no house. But Nancy kind of explained that to me. There actually was a house there when the founding members showed up. Uh, from there, you know, things kind of snowballed. Uh, a lot, they had a lot of annual meetings. Uh, not sure how a lot of the meetings, their regular meetings work, just there are records of it. We have all those. Um, I'm assuming maybe over the phone back in those days. Uh, I wouldn't think they got together other than their annual meeting. Back then, the annual meetings were always held at the ranch in Belvedere, or they held them uh, in Belfouche, South Dakota. There was a couple held there. It was it was quite a while before they started doing like how we do it, where we have our annual gatherings. Uh, those were kind of the for, forefront forefather of our annual meetings. They, we would always have our annual meetings at those two. We we do Zoom calls now on the annual meetings, but uh, you know there've been a lot of changes since then. Uh, back in those days, the the secretary was always the location of the the association. Uh, there was no, we never had an office. We weren't big enough. Uh, so whoever was secretary, they basically had the mailing address for the association. And okay. uh, it was the last, the last secretary to have that was here in Minnesota. Can't remember her name off the top of my head. Probably got it wrote down. But, uh, and then in the 1990s, I want to say 94, the association got a permanent office in the Livestock Exchange Building in Denver, Colorado. And that's the big brick building out in the stockyards in Denver at the, the National Western Stock Show where we have our annual, our national show and sale. And then we were there for, I think, 11 years. And from there, we moved to Brighton to the historic city hall where we are now. Hmm. And I'm not sure what year that was, around 2000. 11 maybe okay 
And then also speaking of South Dakota, I don't think we touched on the, the Hall of Fame much. Um, could you tell listeners about that a little bit as far as, you know, what? Yeah. I mean, pretty cool. We, yeah, we, that, was actually, that was actually fun to do. Uh, kind of the crown jewel of the whole gathering. To, I spent probably a good year and a half, two years working with the South Dakota Hall of Fame, uh, putting up the display. Uh, we did it for the three founding members who are inducted, who have been inducted, uh, Governor Tom Berry, uh, Baxter Berry, and his wife, Lyndall. They're all founding members, all inducted in the South Dakota Hall of Fame. And then uh, one of the side stories that I ended up with was George Bridge, who was a bit of a showman. He had the oxen, and we included him uh, just because his oxen came from our founding members, uh, both from uh, Baxter Berry and he got some from Ray Carr, who was also a founding member. But uh, my time working with the Barry family, lots of photographs. Uh, and we use a lot of those. Uh, when I went out to the ranch, one of the people at the who owned, the ranch was divided up after it was sold from Lindo. So it's actually a lot of smaller ranches now. Uh, at their height, the back, the double X was like 33,000 acres. So pretty, pretty big. One of the people that owns that ranch was one of their old cowboys, and now his son owns it, and his name is Baxter Baderi. And uh, Baxter has just been a wealth of information to me. He's the one that's taken me on tours of the ranch. He's taken me all over. And uh, he had one of the chuck boxes from the old chuck wagons when the ranch was sold. His dad got it. Hmm. So it's it was sitting in his shed, and that was the big piece that I got to the Hall of Fame, and that sits in the display case. Uh, pretty neat old chuck box, just like the old Western movies. Uh, got the big double X brand right on the side. Uh, so that's there. But as I was kind of talking to all the family members and everything, there was actually minimal pictures. Uh, I, I found no Highland pictures. That was kind of bothersome. Until uh, one of the family members told me, well, you got to go sh see Shorty. So Shorty has another one of Tom Barry's grandsons. So I ended up, ended up going to his ranch, and he lives north of Belvedere uh, in a town called Midland. He had basically a museum to the Berry family at his place. He had all of Tom and Baxter's saddles, boots, uh, spurs. He had guns. Uh, he had the, he had two of the chuck wagons that were there that stayed in South Dakota. The rest of them went to Nebraska, but uh. The chuck wagons then were also used in a movie called uh, Born to Buck. Hmm. If you know who Casey Tibbs is, if, you, if you're a rodeo history, history buff, Casey Tibbs was a bronc rider back in the 20s, 30s. Big deal. Well, Casey made a movie back in the 1950s called Born to Buck about trailing a herd of bucking horses to Fort Pierce, South Dakota. In that movie, a little bit of ACA history is there because the wagons they're pulling got the double X brand on them. He borrowed them from the Berry family to make his movie. But anyway, Shorty was a wealth of information. And he he had all of Lindell's photo albums. That that was the, the holy grail find. Literally, I think there was six or eight photo albums full of photos, uh, newspaper clippings, just everything from the ranch in the early association days. And we were able to take all that. Uh, Shorty was gracious enough to let us take it. And we had it uh, scanned in Chamberlain. And then we used those. Those are all the pictures or some of the pictures were used in that Hall of Fame display. Wow. Now, is that display, is, is it still there? Can people still go and see it? Yep. I'm glad you asked. Uh, yeah, the display is there for three years. And so it's, we just finished our first year. It's got two more years to go. So if you're ever going through South Dakota, just stop in and see it. The Hall of Fame, it's free to get in. I think they'll take donations. Uh, but it's it's a pretty big display, probably the biggest display they have right now. And uh, just it's full of a lot of ACA information. Right. And uh, well, like I said, it, it'll, it'll, it'll close in 2026. June of 2026 is when it closes. Okay. Yeah, Kimber and I saw it, you know, when we were at the gathering. And it is well worth the trip for sure well worth going in there yeah too. i thought i mean i gave them the stuff and worked with them but uh when they put it together it was beyond my expectations i did not think it would look that good 
Right. I agree. It was very well done. Very well done. Well, when, uh, when that display is done, when that display is done, we're going to take it because ACA owns that display, except for like Baxter's cowboy boots that are in it and the chuck box has to go back. But all the photos and the books and everything else that are in that display, those belong to ACA. We're going to do one of my historian projects is going to be moving that display back to Brighton, Colorado and putting it up in our office. Very cool. Yeah. Or at least part of it. Yeah. That'll be really neat. I'll mm -hmm. give give yeah. people a, a reason to go to the association headquarters too. I know we've been, yeah. it'd be fun. So, well, Tom, um, thank you so much. I think we're probably going to have you come back and uh, probably talk to us again about some other topics. Um, but we wanted to thank you for all the work that you've done and all the effort that you've put in. Um, I know we have benefited from calling you a friend and I know there are many, many other people that have done the same because I've heard, or I've heard that from other people's mouths before that, that you have stepped in and mentored and helped people. And that's what this is all about. So we just want to thank you on behalf of the association and, and, um, yeah, I mean, you. we just really, we, we love you, Tom. We really appreciate you. Um, Stop, thank, you're making me blush. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for your time uh, today. Um, we want to, if, if you don't mind, we'll probably uh, add a link for your farm. And then also, um, if you want listeners to get a hold of Tom, you can get a hold of us and... Uh, we can get you Tom's information if that's okay with you, Tom. No, I'm a firm believer in paying it forward. So, I mean, if people got history questions on the association, the breed, whatever they, I mean, we love to help people learn how to show. That's kind of our forte here at Pell Creek. Uh, we're just always willing to help. 